Is it visible on the thing? Why isn't it showing anything? No. Cool. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is my fourth and last homeschool class. Uh, the class is called Contemporary Navy and Building a Better White Supremacy. You all can see this, right? So it's semi-visible. I'm gonna move this show. So first we're gonna screen some stuff. Uh, Donio Neil Sotto Voce from 2016. Dimian Vinet Yage's Indigenous Love, Thank You Code the Movie from 2014. And uh, documentation of a live performance by Milford Graves and Amir Baraka at Vision Festival. Uh, it's like a yearly jazz poetry avant-garde festival. Um, and the 18th one was at Roulette in Brooklyn on the 12th of June, 2013.
summary of the past sessions and also just the class as a whole. Um, how is a better white supremacy built? The contemporary is a global imperial force embodied at all levels of Western artistic agency. A valid creation and management system parasitic on local and marginal practice. Uh, some of the tools of that are multicultural capitalism, allied theater and modularization of race, which is the refusal to acknowledge its totality and some of the aesthetic or affective positions that are taken in that context are faux marginality or kind of performance of exhaustion towards value and the circulation of value, uh, as well as the atomization of aesthetics. This idea that there's no accounting for taste, that individuals uh, taste reign supreme. Uh, so in the first class, I looked more closely at that idea um, from David Jocelyn, uh, that one aspect of the marketization of art is that the contemporary positions marginal practitioners in a governing relation of debt to modernism and its afterlife, which is analogous to neocolonial governance by financial debt. This idea that um, black and brown artists, women artists are in debt to modernism and its developments. Um, and so he calls the mitigating factor of that debt heritage. Uh, I kind of think he's copying out and Really, by heritage, what is meant is the debt the modernism owes to marginal practitioners, to black and brown art, the part of women, um, local art. And uh, so this heritage debt ratio for Jocelyn resolves itself in five ways. Um, one is where the debt is forgiven in a context of an enchanted individual who works in a magical economy that isn't subject to the market. Um, one is where debt is refused. Uh, in a form of collective solidarity among marginal practitioners, kind of saying like, no, we don't owe anything to modernism, it's not relevant to us at all. Um, another is a political demand where an artist or a community of artists take the principles of modernism at face value, the kind of claims of political efficacy and, and radicalism that it has, uh, it's taken at face value 
and sort of deployed. That's a serious demand. Um, and then debt can also be sold either for uh, money and market profile or for prestige and national identity. Um, and so that's this Jocelyn's little picture that I like to use, but I do want to keep in mind that heritage is sort of a neo, or it's a euphemism, it's a, a cop out. And I think that he, he doesn't go further enough. Um, and so in session two, I talked about how beginning around the deindustrial turn in the West, the debtors in that relationship in modernism, by which I mean white spaces who are inside the modernist project and its afterlife, perform exhaustion in relation to the circulation of aesthetic value. And we could call this the shadow of Lee Lozano, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, and the class looked at some symptoms such as poetry in the press release, white cube poetry readings, the event economy, community, community engagement. Um, and so this is uh, from Lee Lozano's notebooks. In 1969, she performed her final documented artwork, uh, General Strike Piece, which says, um, and these are instructions that she gave to herself. It says, gradually but determinedly avoid being present at official or public uptown functions or gatherings related to the art world in order to pursue investigation of total individual and public revolution. Uh, exhibit with publics only, I can't read that. Exhibit in public only pieces which further sharing or ideas, sharing of ideas and information related to total personal and public revolution. Um, you know, this is a screenshot of a website of the Social Practice Festival in Portland. Um, in session three, I discussed how in the moment where Western economies shifted from industrial to informational economies and women entered the workforce en masse, um, art institutions began shifting to marketization and developed the deployment of weaponized white femininity. And uh, in 2015, 60% of US MFAs were women, largely white, but by and large, art shows men relegating women to admin roles, the invisible and often unpaid work of facilitating the white keeps whiteness, the ivory towers, ivoriness, and the project spaces for marginality. And this is a long quote from a uh, good head of black essay that I posted in the event page. Um, sorry, it's yourself. And I think the metaphor that I'm trying to draw here in using this quote um, is that that kind of exclusion or aestheticization isn't present just at an institutional level, but it it, it, it kind of goes all the way down, like it's at the marginal level of project spaces and stuff like that. Um, or even like your own practice, like it, it's saturated with market logic. Um, okay, so those are the first three sessions, and then this, this lecture is like a little bit shorter, a little bit more casual, and I'm also like really hungry, so um, we'll talk a little bit about where the individual aesthetic gesture fits in, and I kind of turn the camera toward myself and look at my gesture in general and in this class. Uh, I talk about aesthetic atomization a little bit, and then we can take a vote and see if I should give advice for Mayo. <laughs> democracy at its finest um okay so the gesture capitalism speculative turn 
means that nothing is really outside the market. The individual aesthetic gesture is already saturated by market logic and its notions of value. And one example that I have here as a speech act is I just show my friends. And this could come from the mouth of a project space runner or a gallery director or a curator at an institution. It doesn't really make a difference. Uh, and then my feeling, uh, I may be trapped in the market and relegated to an aesthetic position of dead to modernism, but that doesn't force me to accept the axioms of aesthetic supremacy that underpin art and institutionality. No amount of market logic will trap the aesthetic as a whole general concept uh, inside of the white cube, and no work of art will ever be more beautiful or horrible than the world that reflects or manipulates. It's kind of like platonic, I guess, the idea that art has less value because it reflects a reflection of reality. Uh, but that being said, divestment from institutionality isn't enough. It's not revolution, despite Lee Lozano's gesture. I support divestment, but then what? That's kind of the question. Like, OK, you divested from this context, but now what? Um, and if divestment doesn't precede a reinvestment in alternate structures, it's just performative, a uh, form of apoiteia, or retreat from the political, as I discussed in session three. I would say is this idea of um, inner sanctity by retreating from political or material concerns, like rejecting the political. Uh, and in this way, divestment can just be another performance of exhaustion towards value, a false opening up to the mundane or the vernacular. Uh, so, and I have an example here. Uh, when Guffey Lonigan took a break from art after his 2014 HBO Go intro riff transcription for guitar on ultimateguitar.com, um, when he did that, that took that break, he resulted in a, it resulted in an art form profile. Uh, and the cover was from a Google Maps piece that he did in like 2012. Uh, and it returned to showing institutional work. This idea of like how disappearance can actually become a, a, way, a megaphone. Um, and so that being said, the world aesthetic may be greater than the white cube can contain. But I wonder if perception is so saturated by market logic that the world aesthetic becomes inaccessible. Um, but that is in itself is a kind of false outside because the world aesthetic, like the sensory experiences that we have in the world as we navigate it, aren't outside the market uh, because the idea of the outside the market is, is a false outside. And the false outside is used primarily for utopian white imaginaries and to attack marginal practitioners in their navigation of institutionality and the market, despite the clear fact that, as Hannah Black puts it, the huge questions of how we might wish to live together are always falling under the shadow of the questions of how to live now. The identity artist is not the only one whose attempts at survival collude with violence. And there's lots of good writing about hypervisibility and how collusion with capitalism as a kind of critique of your radical politics mostly affects women of color. But like Beyonce, like she made clothes in a sweatshop. It sucks, she's bad, but also all clothes are made in a sweatshop. You're wearing them as you critique her and call her like garbage, who like is disposable or whatever, right? Um, and so now turning to this idea of aesthetic atomization, a focus on individual gestures lends itself easily to the anti-analytic. This idea of it's just paint on a canvas or it is what it is, etc., and to instant periodization. Uh, and these seem in contrast, but they're both protections of whiteness from different angles. The first appeals to the ahistorical, in which what's in front of you at the moment is the only true real. The other appeals to European methods of constructing historical narratives of the real and a validation of the gesture at hand, and both reject the possibility of a true materialist analysis. And I, I really am interested in this, like, because obviously the, the most famous and best example is like the abstract expressionists who were critiqued as, you know, it's just being on a canvas or it's this religious excellence, like, you know, Rockford or something or Barnett Newman, or it's like the CIA, right, exporting this art as a symbol of the victory of American imperialism and freedom. So like this idea that it's just paint on a canvas is so like, it intrigues me, but it's also so violent and reductive that it's like, how can you actually say that about anything that's material to see it as like in a vacuum as opposed to part of a long process, processes of circulation and labor and stuff. Uh, and in the face of marketization, social pressures, your role in oppression, et cetera. How do you approach your individual gesture? If anyone wants to answer that, you can.
a sort of a rhetorical question and also for that, right? So my gesture. Uh, being open to randomness is important for me. When it amounts to nothing, that is, when aesthetic work doesn't result in an object, I feel grateful. I think conversations and documentation are more important than work itself in a lot of contexts. And I like when these contexts apply to my own art, which I feel is contingently art in the first place. It doesn't really care whether it's art or not. And a bulk of it no longer exists except in low documentation on social media platforms like Tumblr and Instagram. Uh, and in making this class probably the most important thing, um, because I had two, I always have two parts, like screening work and then a lecture. Um, the most important thing was screening work before the lecture so that whatever I showcased wasn't overdetermined by my talk. Um, and the first two lectures I kind of prepared over a week, <coughs> putting a, a fair degree of care into it. But the last two I did the day of with more carelessness. Like I just did a bunch of Adderall today and just like, sloppy white girl, like, do it, just make it happen. I wrote this today on the subway, like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and, but the reason for doing that was to like, let the connections be as associative as possible. And I was scrolling through Facebook the whole time as I prepped slides. The previous ones had a lot more pictures, like taken from whatever I saw in my feed, but for this one there's less. Uh, and I chose lecture format because we call it just conference format, didn't really work for me and relied too much on close reading that I felt very few people truly did away from the class. And that's not, I'm not judging anyone because I, a lot of the time didn't do it either. I like read is a shitty toxic place. Um, but the conference format is like this performative, like you're gonna sit there and pretend that you know everything about what you've read and interrupt people as they speak and, and do this whole thing. And it's like, I would rather just talk and barrage people with words and not say that I interrupt say that I allow interruption, but really just keep going, right? I, don't know. I always wanted my teacher to like talk more in the class, period. even if you know this person didn't necessarily know more than anyone else. It was more of a format issue for me. And so why the subject matter? Why whiteness? I wanted to dissect whiteness in this class because it reproduces so invisibly in spaces where enlightenment notions like art, reason, freedom, justice, the human, the market, etc are in use, uh, and whether in an institutional or faux marginal context, false universality by way of these enlightenment notions circulates to facilitate market logic. So I wanted to look at that and its symptoms. And so switching to this idea of the long durée of the market, long durée is a historical analytic term about looking at specific moments in history as parts of much longer decades or century long processes. Um, so a patina of boredom and technocratic secrecy kept the market operating as usual for a long time, but the recent market crash sparked interest. However, a longer time frame needs to be considered as the speculative financial market and its reliance on agri-colonialism and outsourced industrialization are heirs to older economic forms. While Marx admits to the substantial role slavery played in English industrialization, he flattens the mill passage to economic value, completely erasing the disastrous effects on the actual people traded and speculated on as objects in mercantile capitalism. And that's not even touching on genocide on the actual land itself. Uh, and this industrial moment um, is itself a secular, secularization of an earlier moment in which Southern European Catholic theology birthed an economy, which is from Greek oikonomia, oikos house, bosneme, manage. Um, an economy of discovery and sole right to facilitate genocide, slavery, and land theft. I'm talking about 1492 from this. Um, and this went along with the witch burning and land enclosure in Western Europe as a transition from feudalism to early capitalism, eventually mirroring Southern European colonial, the Southern European colonial project through a more Kantian or a Protestant theology. So in, when you think of the long durée of the market, it sort of ends up being a kind of Russian doll of um, reiterations of this essential principle, right? Where like a body is an object, it can be an object. It can, it can circulate as a platform for self-authentication -authentic or, you know, you have a lot of property or whatever it is, any number of individual approaches. And some react to materialist considerations by saying that it's just identity politics. And I'm still not sure what this means, but I do know that it is quite sad not to see, for example, the formative 
an oppressive relationship between white modernists and African artists at the time. Like, if you're not seeing that, it seems like aesthetic and pop version. Sorry, I went too far. So um, it's like a form of aesthetic impoverishment, like not really seeing what is at hand. And then and now, as Keith Obadike puts it, blackness represents to white artists a freedom of unchecked excess. Uh, and the contemporary relegates black and brown practitioners in a position of debt to modernism to reify this paradigm, keeping us in a labor pool to be tokenistically selected from in a non-performative gesture of inclusion. And this is the quote that I'm drawing from. Like in uh, an interview with Coco Fusco. He says, Surely the net space just makes the same old burnt pork black fish routine easier. This is a sort of white performance tradition. As you may know, some of the early European Dada sound poets and performers claimed that their nonsensical utterances were based on the sounds that Negroes made. So white avant garde works from the Dada performers to Picasso's paintings are rooted in this kind of appropriation. To many white artists, blackness represents some kind of borderless excess some kind of unchecked expression. Like the commonly confused notion that with African drumming or jazz, you just play whatever you feel rather than develop structured content. I would argue that the same kind of romantic freedom is also associated with the net. So that blackness and this kind of digital frontier become conflated. And he's completely right. And you can look at this uh, work by Joe Scanlon called Donnell Wolford from 2014, in which she invented a black woman to circulate in the art economy. He um, sent emails as her, put work up as her, you know, circulated in the economy, this like fake ghost black woman. Um, and the internet has left an indelible mark on both racialization and deracialization, accelerating both and deepening their intersection. This is just a, a piece from Glenn Ligon from 1998. Can't see the text on the bottom probably, but it says, um, portrait exaggerating my black features, so portrait exaggerating my white features. So it's kind of canvas. So take a vote. Who wants to hear advice from Mayo? Yeah, I was like, I can do that. <laughs> So I don't tell people what to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you that not knowing many black and brown artists is aesthetically impoverishing you. You're of course aware of how this ignorance is an embodiment of institutionality, but you may not be aware of how boring your outfit in space, context, or work is due to it. We need less hand-wringing, more research, less tokenism, more resource sharing. And giving up on art means realizing that every human does aesthetic work, that there is no aesthetic supremacy underpinned by institutionality. And bringing that work, uh, this wider aesthetic work into a white cube is not a victory. It's often actually really violent. Um, I feel that when people take themselves too seriously, this is me like putting on my psychologist hat, um, when people take themselves too seriously, it's because they're ashamed of their output. They like automatically are on the defensive before anything is even said. Uh, admitting the problem, like divestment, is also not enough. Sarah Ahmed has this quote, says, whiteness gets reproduced through being declared within academic texts as well as public culture. I will hence be reading whiteness studies as part of a broader shift toward what we could call a politics of declaration in which institutions as well as individuals admit to forms of bad practice and in which the admission itself becomes seen as good practice. Uh, and she argues that this admittance is not performative. She reads J.L. Austin to mean that an utterance is performative when it does what it says. Uh, she quotes his 1975 text saying, the, issue, the issuing of the utterance is the performing of an action. Non-performative utterances don't do what they say. And so Ahmed argues, and I agree, that admitting whiteness is not anti-racist. And here's a quote from Mike Hill. Uh, it says, I cannot know in advance whether white critique will prove politically worthwhile, whether in the end it will be a friendlier ghost than before, or will display the same stealth narcissism that feminist of color labeled the white problem in the late 70s. And it's this not knowing that needs changing. Because now that SJW is cool, as well as sort of marginalized by the wider um, 
American culture, which makes it doubly cool. Certain whites want to be in the conversation, but because white people are used to access, they assume their contributions have inherent value. So I have some exercises here if you're white. Uh, think about race every day from now on. For every album by a musician of color you consume, read two books by authors of color from now on. For every white artist you research, research an artist of color to the same degree of intensity. And think about market and social forces that lead to why you might not already be doing this. Yeah. Oh yeah, homeschool going forward. Um, so semester two features a joint class called Project Space Industrial Complex. And because people aren't sure if they're final or not, I don't want to talk about it, but. Uh, the other class is by performance <laughs> troupe or not. Oh, I'm sorry. I just know Ellie told me this yeah. the other day that it's oh, like. So I didn't want to like personal. Yeah, exactly. So far, it's like being semi hipster is trying to meet, but is including. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> As well as a class by Performance Troop Physical Education, which consists of Keon Gaskin. Ali Hankins, of Taipo, sorry, Lu Li Yim, and Takahiro Yamamoto. And we have upcoming talks next semester by Devin Kenny, Damali Ayo, Gabby Cepeda, Sony Choi, Lizzo LaRoche, Sasha Pachowski, and Jasmine Yende, as well as more poetry readings, possibly online and possibly in Portland. Super excited, it's gonna be awesome. Um, yeah, there you go. Anyone has any questions or wants to say anything? Feel free. I'm going to stop the broadcast because it's still super bright. It's just white today. <laughs> nice. That's good. That's it.